All right, our next speaker is Max Qr Gilia. He hails from the Philippines, where he started his chemistry studies at the University of Philippines, Dillman, in 2011. After a one-year junior instructor position there, he moved to the U.S. to do a Ph.D. in inorganic chemistry at Ohio State University, followed by a postdoc at MIT. Argilia joined the UC Irvine Chemistry Department in 2020. He and his group are investigating how chemical bonding interactions can dictate the atomic structure, nanoscale morphology, and physical properties of a range of exotic materials like 1D solids and magnets and direct band gap emitters and higher order topological materials. So, thank you. Please. for that introduction and also thanks for the CNN family for you know uh, it's honor and you know um, it's nice to meet finally the wonderful cohort of Townsend 12 and um, thanks Paul for that wonderful address and maybe I can share a little bit of a slice of that future that we believe in all right so I'm gonna provide a unique perspective because there's not so many solid-state chemists around so here's how you become one so you start from the Philippines I'm joking but I start um, I grew up in the archipelagic nation of the Philippines, the number of islands is still debated, but Wikipedia puts it at around 7,600 islands, depending on whether it's high tide or low tide. Um, so I grew up in Manila and then moved to the north in La Union, which is the summer capital, uh, which is the surfing capital of the Philippines. While I did not learn how to surf, I was introduced to intriguing solids. So when I was in grade school, I saw this experiment mixing um, uh, sulfuric acid and sucrose, two polarless um, chemicals, forming this black mess of a carbon, which it turns out forms graphitic carbon. Um, and back then it was just cool for me, but it turns out it, it, it is a little bit better because um, this same material could be used as electrodes for batteries, um, for scalable batteries. Um, but that theme and my formal training started really at the University of the Philippines, Suleiman, working in a ship in a bottle synthesis of photodegradation catalysts in the visible range. Um, working with the late Leon Piao and Jr. And, you know, what we we're trying to do back then is to put in inorganic um, complexes and organic dyes in the visible range inside, inside the um, pores of zeolite, Why trapping it in and then coating it with titanium dioxide. In hindsight, it is one good training to introduce someone um, to inorganic solid state and materials chemistry because I learned the <laughs> fundamentals of coordination chemistry and inorganic synthesis. I learned how to look into crystalline materials and crystal structures and also um, I learned about nanochemistry and nanoscience and nanosynthesis. Also, there are some perks to working at the University of the Philippines in the industry of chemistry because as a chemist, you really feel like you're a chemist if you're working in a building that is shaped like uh, benzene rings. Um, you know, being in STEM and having a STEM terminal degree and career is not so common in the Philippines. So when I was applying in grad school, there weren't many of us. There's one or two every year. Um, and it was hard to really look for resources, um, mainly just looking at the internet, seeing what other people do. But there's no mentorship, there's no formal um, you know, platform to really learn how to apply to grad school, especially outside of the Philippines. And now we are changing that as part of the GradMap Philippines Network. Uh, with myself as a mentor and uh, a member of the advisory board, we are um, mentoring Filipino undergraduate students in STEM to apply to diverse um, uh, graduate programs in STEM all across the world and since we started in 2020 we have a couple of hundred uh, mentees who are now all across the globe learning about science technology and engineering um, from Manila Philippines I also did that mistake that Tim did to go to somewhere colder in Columbus Ohio when I did my grad school at the Ohio State University uh, I worked with Josh Goldberger and really in the theme of low dimensional materials and trying to shape and carve out solids, uh, my work in Josh's group uh, dealt in figuring out how we can make really thin two dimensional materials in main group elements and by doing so I was able to create tunable photodetectors, ultra thin magnets and quantum materials and also I created a platform with which we reimagined a little bit how we can transform heat into electricity. And also the theme of benzene rings are still there. This is a uh, the new building that, uh, uh, at Ohio State in the chemistry department. So along those lines, moving from Columbus, Ohio, I've been thinking about dimensionalities, surfaces, and wanted to take it to a whole different level in smaller materials and higher surface area materials. So I went to MIT, I worked with Mir Chedinka, and tried to explore for the first time this notion of peeling off one-dimensional chains for a from a bulk crystalline lattice to explore new electronic, optical, and quantum properties. 
and also at the same time translate what I learned in two-dimensional dense inorganic solids into porous two-dimensional metal organic frameworks where we tried to understand how electrons would flow in this high surface area and highly anisotropic material. So from MIT, I, I, I traveled across um, America and ended up at uh, UC Irvine at the peak of the pandemic uh, in 2020. I was holding my breath you know, during that flight without a vaccine. It was tough uh, and tried to trick yourself. But then I made it and I started the experimental low dimensional condensed matter chemistry laboratory at UC Irvine in 2020, which is a mouthful, that's why you just call it Max Lab. Um, we think about dimensionality, confinement and assembly and hi in hybrid and non-hybrid inorganic solids. And we're really motivated by this problem, uh, by, by this concern, um, basically thinking about materials demands of next generation, ge next generation electronics. So we often think about, in my group, this example of the transistor, which is the size of a thumb back in 1947, 70 years after decades of chemistry, physics, and material science, we ended up with 137 million transistors per square millimeter. So this is a lot of transistors. There's 20,000 of these in the first lunar, lunar module that sent the first humans to the moon. But why do we need this many um, transistors? As a chemist, we ask two questions um, along these lines. First off, which is the more obvious question, how small can materials building blocks be? And the second, how complex can they become? Because maybe we can come up with different new ways to do computation, how we can store data, and how we can um, communicate with one another all across the globe. And of course, there can never be many two transistors because we need them for artificial intelligence, for augmented reality, for machine learning, and we need to make ChatGPT a little bit smarter too. Um, and also, this is prime time to think about that because it turns out that we're losing touch on that art of creating uh, microelectronics and integrated circuits, especially with the recently passed um, Chips and Science Act. It is high time to reimagine and re-envision how we do computing and how we develop materials for next generation electronics. One way we can think about that is through these solids that are held by weak van der Waals interactions. If you open a general chemistry textbook, this is the weakest interaction. It's one of the weakest interactions there is. One good example will, will be graphite, which is the same solid that is, that, that's what we use when we write with the pencil lead, if, if, we, if someone still uses that. Uh, but, but the layered structure of graphite in these weak interactions enables us to peel off, physically peel off graphite into single atom thick layers of carbon. So this sounds like science fiction, but it's not. Uh, because uh, there are a lot of examples now of two-dimensional materials with different compositions, structures, physical properties, and of course, a, a sci-fi approach would need a sci-fi solution, and the way how you get to those monolayers would be scotch tape. Um, and literally, state-of-the-art labs in the world right now use scotch tape to get to a single, single layer atom thick of carbon, or you can use a kitchen blender, but the magic of these materials is their atomic precision. You can use these techniques and still get single layers of carbon with atomic precision. This is an electron microscope of a single layer of carbon. And you can literally count each and every atom. This is what you see is what you get chemistry. So in my group, we want to take this a little bit further and think about one dimensional analogs of these 2D materials. So it was nice following Athena's talk because one can think of this as inorganic analogs of organic polymers without any carbon atoms with the same form factor. These materials will have weak van der Waals interactions across multiple axes, so we can stack them different ways, peel them off different ways. Each building block is less than a nanometer thick, so this breaks the physical limit of what we reach right now in conventional silicon-based electronics. There is chemical modularity, so we can open up a huge library of these materials with different properties, compositions, and structures. And these are, this really reminds me of polymers because we can grow these as large single crystals. And because of those weak interactions across the chains, we can bend these dense inorganic solids, right? And of course, if we think about energy storage and intercalation, this is a crystalline material that can host unique intercalation pathways as well. So when we do this and when we embark on this journey, there's not so many chemistry um, literature that is out there. So we try to address this across length scales. We think about this from the nanoscale where we develop nanoscale test tubes in the form of carbon nanotubes and boron, na boron nitride nanotubes. 
to look into single chains of these structures and understand their physics from a single, less than nanometer thick chain of these materials, we can trick these materials to grow either as very long nanowires or assemble as quasi two dimensional sheets with unique optical and electronic properties depending on their form factor, but, same, but are formed on the same building block. We can also find ways on how to induce metallicity and conductivity in these materials. And I'm still an inorganic chemist, so we think about coordination chemistry, and by doing so, we were able to create materials that display chirality and helicity in the solid state. The vision that we think about is um, a shared vision across many folks working in this discipline. This dream of us is to think about materials and electronics at the sub nanoscale, wherein we could interface and create materials with different dimensionalities in 2D, 1D, 0D, interface them um, for increased functionality. Their interfaces will also be unique and really the end goal is to assemble devices that break the limit of the current state of the art. We can just stack them together using scotch tape or using a polymer uh, and assemble the thinnest devices one could see. Um, and we could reimagine the integrated circuit. As a solid state chemist, we can program dimensionality, functionality, um, and, um, and then properties in these materials. And we could you know, reimagine resistors, capacitors, diodes, wire fiber optics, and sensors that we learned way back into these smaller form factors. Um, for me, I'm a foodie. So sometimes it's quite convenient to describe these wires as pasta. And I'm gonna show a series of technical results, but you can see on the left, the expectations, and on the right, the reality. So we can create very long pasta uh, by tricking these materials to go in one dimension. And by doing so, we were able to create very long nanowires in the scale of centimeters long, um, but are around 20 to 40 to 100 nanometers thick that could transmit photons. So these are very small optical fibers and um, photonic waveguides um, that are in the substrate scale. We also found out ways to assemble linguine into, uh, into lasagna sheets and vice versa. And by doing so, we were able to access nanowires and nanosheets based off of the same building block and access new photonic states, turning these materials that are not intrinsically luminescent into highly luminescent individual wires down to 10 nanometers in diameter. We can also use a catalyst to expand that toolbox and apply this to several classes of one-dimensional Van der Waals solids, some of which could harness dissipationless or resistance-free electron transport across these edges of these materials. So when I talk about um, what you see is what you get chemistry, this is bismuth iodide, and we're looking at the bismuth and iodine atoms in this actual nanostructure that I'm showing. Um, we can also create fusilli with different twists and helicities. We were able to figure out ways to induce helicity without any carbon atoms, no ligands, no hydrogen bonding interactions, and no pi pi stacking interactions in the solid state, we were able to create a Bohr-Decoseter helix, which is a quasi one dimensional structure that is remin reminiscent of the collagen structure, but in inorganic terms. This is an actual electron microscope image of these um, Twizzlers. And we see second harmonic generation, which is what enables us to see this laser light from a rare earth emitter. Basically, um, a material that has a broken inversion symmetry can translate two photons into one photon that has a higher energy. Um, and this is what happens in this laser. But also, this offers us a way to filter electronic spins and direct them in different ways. So we can use these as filters for spintronic applications. Um, we can stuff the rigatoni. Um, we can stuff single carbon nanotubes with single chains of these materials, emergent photophysical states emerge in the visible range, and we can actually see antimony and selenium atoms under the electron microscope. And finally, we can add the secret sauce to spaghetti. Um, we can use ionic analogs of these materials, functionalize them with various or, um, organic groups that can alter the structure of these materials, alter the photophysical properties and luminescence, and even the electrical transport properties of these one-dimensional structures. So all of these would not be possible without the contribution of my group, from undergraduate students, graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, previous colleagues and collaborators and funding agencies. And um, before I end, I, um, 
when the news um, came out, the talent of 12, one of my students asked me, so what's your talent? And it was a hard question to answer. And now I'm realizing that maybe my talent is putting together all of these um, brilliant minds from different backgrounds to create um, new materials that will address our problems in terms of modern electronics. My group started in 2020. It was the height of the pandemic. We never had the group photo for a while until last year. And we were um, nostalgic. So I asked them, we should do a throwback group photo. Um, maybe in the 60s, they said no. 70s, no. 80s, no. They thought that 90s is already retro. So this is our first group photo last year. Um, and hopefully, um, I got you hungry for some pasta dish and I'd like to, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks, Max. Uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, the the Chips and Science Act. These, this, there's you know money uh, from the Biden administration to develop the uh, semiconductor industry mm -hmm. here in the U.S. I, I think of that as directed mostly at manufacturing. You know, so Intel, TSMC will build big plants. But is is there money available for research like yours, and can you get any? Yes, yes. No, that's a very good question. And while the huge chunk of it is uh, dedicated to the back end in the manufacturing. So um, National Science Foundation funds the FUSE program, which is the future of semiconductors, which has a specific thrust on developing new materials that could um, change, ba you know, basically just, uh, you know, rethinking about, you know, s is silicon the best material for this job or maybe not. But so there's fundamental research in material discovery that is a smaller chunk, but is still a good chunk in that um, chips and science. Act. But thank you very much for that question. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I was interested about the mentorship program that you mentioned. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you think are some of the biggest challenges facing undergrads that you are mentoring, and what are the ways in which an organization like the American Chemical Society may be of support? Yeah, that's a very good question, and, and quite complex, too, because we're thinking about it from um, the Philippine landscape, where STEM is really not a, a, you know, like a career path or, or a, a common career path. So, um, one of the things that we wanted to do, especially in the beginning, which was easier during the pandemic because of your virtual setting, is to really just do the information um, sort of gay. Basically talk to a lot of students, show them that this is a legitimate career path and then there's many opportunities um, that can be done. And you know, basically being a scientist back then was a dream and now it's turning into a reality. So something um, like in, in the lines of information, especially, and because there's a lot of misconceptions, especially back home in terms of, you know, what the graduate program is, what the career in chemistry is. So I think that's one thing that we're trying to address, but also at the same time, um, really just recognizing um, sort of the, the intrinsic talent in, in the students. And this is not, you know, distinct for the Filipino community, but for everyone, it's really just realizing that one can go to chem can do chemistry and with the proper mentorship I think we're already seeing that in the program that you know most of our mentees are getting really good offers across the globe but thank you very much for the question